Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome to the Caring View chat show, podcast, free resources. We are here to educate, elevate, and celebrate all things social care. Before we get started, go and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you're not already subscribed, you'll miss out on fabulous conversations and topics and learning materials. Uh, head over to our Spotify page and give us a follow on there for exclusive podcasts. Currently in season three at the moment, discussing entrepreneurship, startups, influences, and top tips on how you can get going on your own startup journeys. And go to www.thecaringview.co.uk for all of your free, yes, free resources and access to all of our content. Uh, everything we discuss tonight is of our own opinion and not our respective organizations or companies, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. Mark, hello, how are you? Hello, good evening. How are you? Not too bad myself, thank you. I'm good, thank you very much. I've gotten over the trauma and upset and heartache of not having uh, Eurovision Song Contest tickets because I've seen our act and we're going 26th. I'm not that hopeful, so <laughs> I, you know, I can I can watch it from the comfort of my. Heart. I got excited when I thought it was going to be steps. You know, I had heartbeat away. You know, all of that. I was excited, but yeah, I'm over that now. I, I, that that part of my life is done. I've closed the door. Grief done. I'm sure um, Steps will be coming to a town near you very soon. I mean, S Club 7 are back together. I did get tickets to go and see them, so I'm not ashamed to admit that. So, <laughs> no. I will say, Joe from S Club 7, mm, a little bit sort of, you know, problematic. She's still a bit problematic post-Celebrity Big Brother days. Oh, yeah, no, um, but, you know, is what it is, is what it is. Um, although you did get my uh, hopes up when you texted me the day, and it was like, oh, tickets are back on sale for Eurovision. It was like £45,000. Oh, like, the price of those... I think there was only like 10 of them, but £45,000 a ticket. I think even if I had £45,000, it wouldn't be going to see Eurovision as much as I love it. But Well, I told you I'd spend my £45,000 on it. It's not for this show, so I won't repeat it. But yes, it would not be on Eurovision tickets. Um, so Eurovision aside, what's in the news this week? And let's not dive into the whole BBC Gary Lineker rubbish. Because, you know, we've got Jeremy, I know I'm going to dive into it, actually, because it really pissed me off. We've got people like Jeremy Clarkson and Piers Morgan who can go around literally inciting hate, misogyny, racism, homophobia, all sorts of god awful right wing bullcrap all over the media and still get to do what they do. And Gary Lineker's like, oh, oh our immigration policy is a bit crap and we're not really looking after people. And like, oh, my God, sack him, take him off this, take him off that. Bloody double standards, in my opinion. But that's the media for you. you. Won't have any of that on the caring view. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I haven't really followed it. I think because it's been linked really to match of the day and spot. I haven't really followed any of it, if I'm completely honest. But I think it's really hard, isn't it? I think we're all governed to some extent by the companies we work for. Because I wouldn't be able to sit on my Twitter and bash them. Not that he's bashing the BBC, but yeah, I. I don't know. I don't really have an opinion either way, to be fair. To me personally, I feel like social media is an extension of your voice. So you should be able to say what you want and do what you want on social media, as long as it's not bringing your company or anything into disrepute. And I don't feel like that tweet, I wouldn't have read that and thought, oh, he works for the BBC at any point. But The problem with it is, is the BBC have this policy of impartiality, which, you know, I just... Is there a place for the BBC in modern day world? I don't know. I don't think so. But that is, by the by, without the BBC, we'd have no Doctor Who, which would upset me. Um, social care news. Have we got anything big going on? Is there anything that we need to talk about? I suppose the only big news is tomorrow's budget announcement and whether there'll be anything in there for social care and what that's going to look like. And I'm not really holding out too much hope as much as I'd like something to be there. I would have actually put money on me getting Eurovision tickets over <laughs> anything recent coming out of tomorrow's budget. So I'm going to try and manifest some positivity. I don't see it happening. It is what it is. Um, we have got five days left, including today. So four from tomorrow to get your auditions in for Care Sector's Got Talent. Um, so please do head over to their website. Please do go and ask your teams and the people you support what the hidden talents are. Please ask someone if they do burlesque, because I really do want a burlesque talent at this year's show. Um, obviously, we welcome singers and all of that jazz, but it's going to be great to see something diverse. Magicians, can you saw somebody in half? I hear Matt Hancock's going to be out of a job soon, so he could be your magical assistant to saw him in half. You might not need to be good at magic to do it. I don't know, just saying. Um, Mark, what are you wanting to see at this year's talent show? Oh, I don't know. I'm trying to think of something that doesn't relate to a dog or a walking pet of some sort, but 
I don't know, maybe a juggler. I did see a fantastic juggler the other day that was kind of going up and down steps and must have had about 20 different balls. Or maybe somebody just doing good old fashioned comedy that just has you in stitches. Just something old style, I think, as opposed to something new. That would be good. Now that you're saying that, I want spoken piece. I want like a spoken piece. You know, like one of them sort of poetry pieces that are like really hard hitting and you sit there, you don't have to be embarrassed or actually enthralled by it. So yeah, something like that I think would be quite good. Other than that, we have got um, UK Care Week coming up next week. We do have a show prior to it. I know we don't usually do them, but neither of us are travelling down the day before this year. And we're going to be doing, talking about nursing and social care next week. But UK Care Week, do come and join us for the conversation. Um, is any publicity really good publicity? Does social care do itself a disservice? Um, that is going to be on March 22nd. It's free to attend if you are a social care provider. Um, so please do go check them out. We'll provide the links in the comments later on in the show. Um, other than that, I think we're pretty much good to go on tonight's conversation, Mark. Yes, I think so. So tonight, oh, we... sorry, oh. no new podcast that is out. Uh, the episode this week was with Sophie Coulthard. Do go check that out. Sophie is absolutely incredible. You know, we think she started the whole social care podcasting craze with um, the Road to Outstanding. Brilliant podcast. Go and listen to it if you haven't. Um, but that is available on our uh, podcast site as well. You can listen directly from our website or go to Spotify. Really great interview, though, with Sophie. Over to you. Sorry, Mark. No, not at all. I think that podcast was a joy to record, but I equally enjoyed it listening to it while I drove to work as well. I thought it was actually really good. I think it's just really honest as well from an entrepreneur, which is really nice. And so... But yes, on to tonight. So we are discussing the DSPT tonight. So we've got Katie Thorne and Michelle joining us. Good evening, both. How are you? Yeah, very good, thanks. Good, good. Michelle, you're on mute, just so you know. <laughs> it happens to us all. It happens to us all, don't worry. <laughs> good evening, Michelle. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Good, good. Before we start tonight's show, did both of you just want to do a quick introduction just to let the um, viewers know who you are and what you do? Katie, we'll start with you. Sure, thanks, Mark. So, yeah, hi, everybody. Really pleased to be here. So I'm Katie Thorne. Um, I'm the project lead for Digital Social Care, which is a project run by the Care Provider Alliance um, and funded predominantly by NHS Transformation Directorate to provide free support and advice to care providers around technology, data protection and cybersecurity. And Michelle? Hi, yes, so I'm Michelle Corrigan. I am the Programme Director for Better Security, Better Care, which is the Department of Health and Social Care's programme for improving cyber and data security in social care through supporting people to complete their DSPT primarily. Thank you very much. So I think we'll go right back to basics. Can you just let us know what the DSPT is and what that stands for? Should I take that one? Yeah. Um, okay, so the DSPT is the Data Security Protection Toolkit. And basically it's the NHS standard for organizations to evidence that they have an adequate standard of data and cyber security. Um, I think the most important thing about it that gets forgotten all the time is that it's a toolkit. So basically you go, um, you sign up and register and then it will take you through a series of questions across four sections. Um, telling you what you need to kind of put in place in your organization. A lot of it you'll already have, so you just tick it. Other things, if you don't have them, it'll tell you what you need. Um, and at the end, then you can publish, and you publish a, a number of standards. So there's approaching standards, standards met, and standards exceeded. Um, those standards then enable you to access certain systems within the NHS, usually shared um shared information systems, so GP Connect, NHS Mail, did I say it, digital shared care records. Um, but also, it, as an organisation, it enables you to evidence that you've met the, the standard for data and cybersecurity and just have that peace of mind that you know everything's in place. Um, it's an annual thing, so you have to update it year on year, but once you've done it the first time, that check becomes much easier to do. Oh, sorry, good job. I was just going to just add something there as well, just to say as well that even though it's was it's hosted by the NHS, it, there is a social care specific view of this, which has been co-produced with care providers in the sector. So if some of you maybe saw it sort of three, four years ago, and it used to be called the IG Toolkit, and it was this really horrifying, scary thing, which was developed for NHS trusts, 
that's not what it looks like anymore. We've had a lot of care managers who've been really involved with making sure it's more appropriate and right for care providers and not NHS focused anymore. And I mean, I'm you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna act ignorant, even though I've already discussed off air that the DSP toolkit is one of my favorite things to do because I'm an absolute saddo. But it sounds really long, it sounds really laborious, it sounds boring, and it sounds like it's going to take up my resources and time. So how important is it that we get this DSPT, and is it an annual document, how important is it that we get it completed? I think it's incredibly important. If you strip away everything else, all of the things that it enables you to do, and all of the reasons that you get asked to do it, if you're a provider... These are things that are outside your wheelhouse. If you're a registered manager of a single care home or if you're running, you know, multiple care homes, this is a way for you to, in one place, say, I know I've boxed this off. I know that if I've got all of these things checked, that I can have a little bit of peace of mind that as an organisation, we are safe from things that aren't my, you know, they're not my passion. They're not the reason I come to work every day. So if every year I go through this process, which can be laborious, it can be, you know, slightly daunting. We've worked really hard to make sure that the language is reflective of the way that we work in social care, that, you know, we're not using clinical terms, that we're using explanations that reflect what we do. That once I've done that, then I can kind of take a breath and say, you know, the whole world of like cyber security is a scary far away thing, but actually it's a real threat to organisations. It's a real risk. If I'm a registered manager or if I, you know, I'm even a frontline worker, it's not what I do. The DSPT allows you to go, okay, if I do this, as hard as it might be, I've done something that ticks that box and kind of make sure that we are safe. You raise a really interesting point, and it's just something I want to follow up on that. Whose responsibility is it? Because we do seem to be putting more and more on our registered managers. And like you've just said, you know, it's not what you do every day. It's not what you're usually getting into. Now, don't get me wrong. I know registered managers need to know that it's no longer acceptable to have a list of names, date of births, addresses, and phone numbers up on the wall so they can phone them in a glance. And they do need to understand that actually there's things they can't do. Who do you think is responsible for completing the DSPT and maintaining the sort of um, adherence to it, the compliance to it? I think it's an interesting question because I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all answer. You know, some organisations have the luxury of having somebody that they, you know, employ for their digital and their tech. Those people have got somebody there that they can assign that to. In those much smaller organisations in our SMEs, I totally take your point that registered managers are overburdened with things. But if you're responsible for everything in the organisation, then this goes with that. If you're that kind of central point for managing things, that doesn't mean you have to do it. You might have a staff member who's particularly interested. There might be an Adam in the wings who's like, I can't wait to get my teeth into a checklist. You can, you know, delegate it to someone. You can use it as a a, um, development opportunity for an individual. But I think if you're the one who holds the reins on things like capacity tracker, on things like your CQC, then you also want to keep the reins on this. If I can find the mute button. Um, I think for me, when I completed it, and I also completed it um, when I was at, um, I won't name the company, but supporting 10 different offices across London, is actually that what I found is it gave you a checklist to review so much of your business, of what you do, making sure that you've got steps in place. But actually, I didn't find it like the capacity tracker that was just a mundane task of letting somebody know and thinking, oh, actually, nobody's going to monitor this. It actually allowed you to put risk assessments in place. It allowed you to think, oh, actually, we should be doing that. Are we doing that? Are we doing that as well as we can be? What can we do better? So actually, I found it a really beneficial toolkit. And I know the offices that I've supported have done the same and found the same. Just listening to you, how many providers, do you have stats around how many social care providers have completed it and what the uptake's been? Yeah, so, I mean, we've... The growth has been phenomenal. So I took over this role two years ago and 13% of social care providers had completed it. We're about to hit 60%. So it is far, it's really becoming the norm in the in the sector to have your DSPT in place. Um, and I think the other thing I would say about it is you don't have to do it on your own. So the program that I run, Better Security, Better Care, provides free support 
every single local authority has what we call a local support organization. It's usually a, your local um, care association. Sometimes it's an NHS partner. And for free, they will come and sit with you and help you fill out your DSPT. We've got dozens and dozens of resources. So, you know, where it tells you you need this policy or you need a risk assessment, it's all available as a template on the Digital Social Care website, which is in the chat. So there's tons and tons of support as well. So, you know, we get that it's nobody's favourite thing to do, except Adam's. Um, we get that it becomes, you know, it's on a long list of other things to do. But it is something that for the minute, while my programme exists, you don't have to do on your own. I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that there was free templates and, and stuff like that, which I think is incredible. So, yes, everyone, please do go check those out. It'll make your life easier. Don't reinvent the wheel if the wheel already exists. Now, Katie, you and I, you know, we've worked together in the past and, you know, we've had many conversations around um, data, around digital, around the DSPT toolkit, but also around um, how data in compliance can actually impact businesses. So can completing or not completing the DSPT affect contracts and tenders? Does it make us more desirable to commissioners, to the regulators? Um, what's the sort of stitch there? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So what we're seeing is increasingly uh, local authority commissioners are expecting the DSPT to be there for when they're commissioning. So it can really be something which will make and break going forward. And I think we'll see more and more local authorities doing the same thing. It's already a contractual requirement for NHS standard contracts, so anything to do with FNC funding as well, you should be doing contractually with a security protection toolkit. Um, I think also, just to sort of pick up again on what Mark was saying before, I think it does also give you ways of sort of thinking about your business efficiencies as you complete the toolkit. It's quite rare when I speak to care providers, when I do it myself, that people really change what they're doing day to day. You don't have to suddenly do a complete overhaul of your processes. We all know what confidentiality is. We're kind of just writing it down for the first time. You know, like CQC says, if you haven't written it down, you don't have evidence that you're doing it. But when I speak to care providers, quite often they're kind of looking at the data they have and how they're processing it and who they're sending it to. And, you know, we all have those things with like the local authority where you've been sending them the same spreadsheet for a couple of years. And you kind of get in touch with them and go like, hey, you know that spreadsheet you asked for and I still send to you, do you need that? And they come back and go, oh, no, no one looks at that. That inbox isn't even monitored anymore. So you go, great, well, I can have that time back of like that spreadsheet which you just never told me you didn't need anymore. So they, there is things that you can do as well from an individual business basis as well as your external contracts. And you also get the added benefit that you then get access to NHS mail as well, don't you? Which I think is a big reason why so many care providers have done it. And I know for myself that actually one of the contracts that I support wouldn't engage without an NHS email address. Are you able to mm -hmm. give us more background kind of on that and how that works for people? Yeah, so NHS Mail is a national free secure email service, obviously NHS Mail. Um, in order to share health and care information by email with the NHS, you have to have what's called a securely accredited email at DCP 569. Um, you can go through a very long and arduous process where you get NHS Digital to accredit your own email systems. You have to get tested and it can take from about eight weeks to six months for that process to happen, would not recommend. Or you can do the data security and protection toolkit. You just need to reach approaching standards the first year. So that's a reduced number of questions, not the full question set. And then you can apply for NHS mail accounts and have them up to 10 accounts per location. And you also get a shared mailbox as well, which is sort of a generic one, which multiple members of staff can access. Um, this is sort of a higher level of security that a standard email address would have, which means it's safe for you to be then sharing that confidential personal information, you know, to share information about somebody's care or their health records. So it's just that extra level of security for the sector, which is also why increasingly the NHS won't share information or do any contracting with people who don't have NHS mail accounts. I think... Uh... The NHS mail plug alone is a reason to go and grab it, isn't it? I mean, and it was one of the reasons I went and completed it first time around. It was like, shine a new email address. Oh, I can't wait to have that. But actually, it opens up a world of options to you. 
you know, you can literally just email you. I mean, you can find your doctors directly through the directory. It's yeah, amazing. It's like, hi, doctor. Amazing. Yeah, You've not you picked do. your phone up today. Where's the medicines? Um, so I do love the ability to be able to directly communicate with the NHS, knowing full well that, you know, it's it's safe and allowed to do it. No more sending, um, I don't know, faxes or emails out with uh, data births and, and all of that sort of jazz on them. So, yeah, I think that's... Uh, a good selling point for it. I'm four years in, I think, of giving out these email addresses almost. And I, I'm, I'm still surprised that the compliance is as is, is low as is, is the 60%. I thought we would be a lot higher. So what specific data security risks are unique to the social care sector? We've just spoken about emails, end-to-end encryption and all of that. And how does the, the, the DSPT, the data protection, see the uh, DSPT, remind me, digital, social, no, remind me again. Data security protection toolkit. God, I the the brain yeah. fart there, like, didn't I? <laughs> How I does think, the DSP? <laughs> on that question, Adam, I think there's a few things. One is the biggest risk you have with data is usually your frontline staff. It's usually the people who are carrying that data around, and especially in care where you've got, you know, your home care visits, you've got people who are out and about as well as those residential settings. Um, one of the standards in the DSPT is that you have 95% of your staff trained on data and cyber security. Now, it seems like an awful lot, but the peace of mind that that gives you then to say that when something goes wrong, because ultimately we're dealing with people here, something will go wrong, you can kind of take it back to was that person trained or not? And chances are they were, and that protects you as an organization to an extent, especially when you bear in mind that things like um, data breaches put you at risk with the ICO, as well as the safeguarding risk of what might be in that information that then it might get you in trouble with CQC. You, just go back point, quickly for people that are listening, okay. Michelle. Sorry, the ICO, just the so ICO, people are aware the what information the ICO commissioner's is. Office. So if you are an organization that holds data, whether it is three staff members' names or, you know, thousands of um, clients' names, you should be registered with the Information Commissioner's office. And that then gives you a duty of care that you have to report any data breaches within 72 hours, isn't it, Katie? Yeah. And then if you, can, if you are proved to have not been you know, adequately secure, that you've not taken care with that information, your organisation can then be fined. And they're not small fines. And in this day and age, we, we need all the money we can possibly get. None of us have got money floating around in the bottom of the drawer, have we? How much is registration with the ICO? For anyone who's listening to this and having a hot sweat at nearly 8 o'clock on, on a Tuesday evening going, oh, my gosh, I don't think we're registered with the ICO. How much can they expect to pay for their sort of registration? Do we know? It's a sliding scale based on organisation size, so based on number of staff and also your annual turnover. The vast majority of social care organisations, smaller organisations, I think you're in the 30 to £50 pound for a year sort of range. If you're part of a large group, um, it will be more for that. would be a head office responsibility to do it. Um, and also once you've registered, it's an annual renewal again, but sort of like a direct debit with like any kind of direct debit you do, you can just set it to auto roll. Um, and last time that ICO uh, actually decided to go out and find care homes that were specifically not care providers in general who hadn't registered, the fines were about a thousand pounds. So may as well pay. The, and that's just for not registering. They may as well pay. They're like less than a hundred quid now to avoid a thousand pound fine down the road. I was just on their website as you were talking, and they also have a free self-assessment, so you can log on. It says it takes five minutes. So I think if anybody hasn't got that, then you should definitely have a look into it. Um, yeah, and some very small micro organisations who are charities, you're free as well. You still need to register, but they'll just tell you it's too small. Don't worry about it. You can be on for free. So on the subject of cost, how much do you think it costs for a care provider to implement and maintain the data security protection toolkit um, in terms of a member of staff, possibly their hourly rate? Um, do you have any kind of insight into that cost for a care provider to maintain it? It's really interesting. It's not something we've looked at, but it absolutely is something I should have to hand. Um, again, it depends on 
where you're starting from. So for most organizations, what we find is by the time they've gotten over the fear, they've kind of registered, they've closed it, said, that's not for me. And they've looked at it again, said, nope, that's not a today task. And when they finally sit down to do it, most of it's already in place. So for a huge chunk of it, it becomes a checkbox exercise of, yep, got that, got that, got that, got that. There might be, you know, a few things that are outstanding that they need to go to. Now, then it depends what size those things are. If it's a case of a couple of policies are missing, then go to the digital social care website, grab a template, put them in place. If it's you've got to train 95% of your staff and actually only about 30% of your staff are trained, that becomes a bigger job. Um, so I don't think there's a one size fits all. What I would say is for the most part, the feed that we have, and it is anecdotal, is that it's not as big a job as I thought. Yeah, and I must admit, that's exactly how I felt when I was doing it. I know there was a lot of me messaging people at kind of one in the morning, like, is anybody awake to help me? Because that's when I was doing it. But you are absolutely right that there are so many free resources. If you don't have that, and I was obviously doing it as a small provider, so we didn't have, you know, huge teams of HR and, you know, legal and bits and pieces behind us. It was just me the staff members and the director that own the care home and actually those templates are really easy to actually just take from your website adapt and put into your service and i think most of our care staff should be trained under the gdpr because when that rolled out there was a requirement for actually all staff to be trained to a to a level anyway so yeah i don't think the cost side adam how did you find it when you rolled it out because you were obviously working for a small care provider as well yeah, I mean, it was weird for me because I was, it, we were a joint service. So we were joint registered for a home care service and, and the care home. And we only seemed to really, I don't know if she was saying this, only really seemed to get it through once. So we only had to sort of like complete it once for both services. So it was like doubling up on a lot of the information at times. So it was like, you know, we communicate to our team in the care home this way, but we also use Proton Mail, which is end-to-end -end encryption for our domiciliary teams. You know, and, you know, luckily for me, I, I understand this stuff. I get this stuff. I, I enjoy this stuff. It's... Again, it is sad. Um, so I didn't find it too bad. And like I say, I would take this over the PIR a thousand times um, to complete. So actually doing it, again, I enjoyed But I was also one of those people, Mark, who was, I mean, I know we probably didn't know each other at the time, which is crazy to think about a time before I knew you. But I was probably one of those managers that would be up till 11 o'clock saying to people, does anyone need a hand completing it? Because I don't mind, you know, going through it with it and having this conversation and, I think one of the things I want to discuss tonight about it is the sort of difference between things like information governance, confidentiality, privacy policies. They all sound very similar, but I know a lot of them are very different. Um, so for people who are listening to this, who may be new to their RM role, who may have never actually heard of the DSPT and actually are just going into it now, um, or complete it every year and still don't feel completely confident, what differences do we need to know between things like information governance, data protection, privacy, uh, confidentiality? Is there a difference? Do they feed together? Do we need separate policies for each? Katie or Michelle? Yes, they definitely feed together the way that I conceptualize it. So information governance is a really broad topic, which very much is about the way that we are using, handling, storing data day to day in our jobs. One section of that is the data protection legislation. So by law, we all have to meet the requirements in the UK GDPR and the Data Protection Act 2018. So there's that sort of regulatory legislative piece. And as part of that, you have to publish a privacy notice, for example, you need to tell people by law how you're using their data and make that really accessible to them, which is why you always see the privacy notices now on the bottom of everyone's websites. Um, but broader than that, which isn't sort of covered necessarily by law, you also have quite a lot of the more ethical questions around data where it's like, yeah, sure, technically you can do that. But actually, ethically, morally, should we be doing that? Is that actually a conversation where it's going to depend on your staff teams, the relationships you have with your residents, your clients and their families and that sort of side of things where... That, so that's why I kind of think of information governance as a little bit broader than just the data protection piece. And just one last thing, because we're talking about data protection now, and everyone's minds are instantly going to go to computers, to um, <laughs> software. Um, we know full well there are files out there, there are um, booklets out there, there are random sheets of paper decorating desks across the country. 
what do we need to know about data and and literally hard copies of it? I mean, we can't just be thinking about digital stuff, can we? So what sort of restrictions should we be thinking in our heads around the, 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 the actual paper versions of this data? Okay, so data protection definitely covers paper as well. To date, the only care providers who've been fined by the Information Commissioner's Office for being in breach of data protection legislation have been from paper-based files, actually not digital systems. So that's mainly things like accidentally leaving like a care plan on top of the car and driving away or, you know, sending uh, that, that sort of thing, which you hear about every now and again. Uh, so, yeah, very much about paper as well. Um, you don't get to avoid it. So in terms of paper, then there's different security you need to be considering. So you need to be um, thinking about the security of your archived files, for example. I'm sure everyone's got a business continuity plan where you're covering what happens like flood fire and that sort of thing you need to be thinking about that paper information uh, you need to think about physical access to your folders i'm not saying we go back to the days where the register manager would lock care plans in the office and then any of the weekend staff couldn't access any care records like obviously not but we do need to make sure that no one can walk in off the street and just take all this confidential information um, and then when it's sort of at the end of your archive process you really need to be thinking about confidential shredding of information um, I know some people who I will not mention names have maybe in the past you know in a bonfire in you know, quite rural uh, no you do need to have records that you've met specific standards of how you've destroyed this information if it's confidential um, we do have on digital social care sort of specific guidance on like securely getting rid of confidential information and like the records you need to keep around it so we're not leaving people to figure that out on their own but those are sort of the more of the kind of things you'd be thinking about with paper records. And just one last thing on this before I hand over to, to Mark again. Michelle, how long do we need to keep paper records for? Because I know some people go, oh, we keep them three years. Some people go, oh, we keep them for seven years. Is there an actual finite time that we can keep them and then think, actually, I need to free up space now and destroy them? There's a couple of answers to that because Ooh. some are dictated by contracts. And then there's the more broad guidance, the year of which I can't remember and Casey's going to have to answer. Yeah, so we would recommend a standard, the Records Management Code of Practice. I'm just going to send the link in the chat, hopefully, so then that can be shared out. Um, if in doubt, we would check, we'd recommend looking at that as sort of a minimum. You do need to cross-reference with some contracts will expect you to hold things for a long time. Insurance companies in particular, I find, really want you to hold on to data for a long time. Though I did hear of one who's asked people to keep hold of their record for 40 years. And this poor person was running out of like attic space under like the cupboard, under the stairs. Like <laughs> yeah, if, they, if they say 40 years, go back to them and say no. <laughs> we have a shorter period of time. But um, yeah, that's the sort of standard I would say is a minimum to keep it for. Thank you very much. I've just shared that into the chat as well. Um, and I will find another link as well, because I know this came up, must have been a couple of years ago now, kind of early on into my blog around retention of documents. And you are right, there's so many different guidelines for different places and different contracts. Um, and I know I wrote a blog on it, um, so I'll find that in the background in a minute and share that out, because that kind of broke down all the common things that social care providers have and how long to keep, keep bits and pieces for. Um, I just wanted to speak about any challenges that care providers have faced. Do you know of any challenges that people have faced completing this and how they overcame that? I think the big one that we find all the time is the training of staff. So as we say, the 95% um, standard for having your staff trained is really high. Um, however, that 95% number and what that training needs to be isn't as formal necessarily as you need to get all of your staff in a room, which we know is never going to happen, and train them for four hours on confidentiality. Because, you know, if you've got your staff in place and you train them as part of their induction, and then each year refresh it, that's more than adequate. You just need to be able to evidence that you've done something. Um, if organisations are finding it difficult um, to get their staff in, you know, speak to your local support organisations because there's also resources you know, provided locally by various um, local authorities have courses, the HEE, you know, NHS England does a course there, it's not the most applicable to um, 
case staff, but it's, it's something that that for us is the, the big challenge. And the other one is, is part of the kind of um, the perception that when we start thinking about the things we need to do to reduce risk, it can make organizations kind of take a little like a shrink back from wanting to do any more. So, you know, I talk all the time about all the brilliant things that the DSPT opens up for you. Um, but at the same time, we talk about the cyber risks and the fact that, you know, once you've got more digital suppliers, you know, things like ransomware attacks or, you know, the stuff that we think of like hackers in a dark room can suddenly come to our front door, which is social care providers. We've, we've got enough on our plates. We don't need anything else. Um, so the balancing the opportunities that the DSVT affords you with the increased risk that doing anything new does, whether, you know, when you suddenly start using a new kind of digital entry system to your care home, that increases the risk of that going horribly wrong. When you start a new, you know, migrate all your staff over to Microsoft 365, good luck. That can start whole new, like, worlds of risk. Um, and it's how we support providers who aren't data and cyber professionals. I'm not a data and cyber professional. I came from this very much from a social care point of view. Like the last time I touched the DSPT before I started this job was the IG toolkit. And I promise you when I first opened up the test, it was like through one eye. I was like, uh, mm, here's the test site. And I was like, oh God, coming out in hives from the last time I'd done it. And it's a completely different thing. It's a completely different kind of um, entity now. It is designed for, with input by social care. Um, because it's managed by the NHS, you can feel like another thing we're being asked to do by the NHS. But this is in, you know, as an organization, just internally is really valuable. Like it just will make you a better organization. Our program is called Better Security, Better Care, because I truly believe that if you are a secure organization, if you can evidence that you are keeping people's information safe, that makes you better at care. So I, I agree with you. I fully agree with you. And in fact, before I go on to another sort of question of mine, that's not on the list and Mark's going to have a heart attack because I'm not keeping to our sort of format of questions. We have had a question coming into the chat, which is where can I discard of the paper records, please? So we've already said bonfires and oh no. Um, I have known of people shredding them and using them in chicken coops is, is bedding. And I'm presuming that's a no no. Um, so where do we discard of paper records securely, safely? And I'm going to also add on to this. How do we not get ripped off doing it as well? I know you probably can't advise too much on things like that, but what's the best way? So, as I said, we have specific guidance on this, and I'm now just going to really quickly open that up because basically there is a specific standard that official um, companies who destroy confidential information have to meet. I would recommend to make sure you're not being ripped off that it's actually an official company who are doing what they need to do that you make sure that they are meeting that standard which it becomes with a bs or something which now i say it doesn't sound like a very promising start but <laughs> i'm sure it's like bs or something yeah it probably <laughs> totally is if they're going to charge for it i presume it's very much like then you know making sure that when you get rid of your furniture and someone comes to pick it up to skip it you get a receipt and you know that they're not going to go fly to it somewhere is that correct? Yeah. yeah. And it doesn't need to be super expensive. Local to me, there's a social enterprise that does it. Wow. Um, you know, it's a recycling social enterprise, and it's pretty affordable compared to especially some of the big boys that come out and take it away, and you'd think that they were going to feed it to unicorns. <laughs> We've, we've had another, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have people believing now that we feed data to unicorns and that's probably what gives them their sort of like omnipotent magic. We've had another question come through, um, uh, following with interest in this debate, had it, has it ever happened in the history of the NHS that data had been leaked? If yes, um, what's been done? Now, I'm just going to tell you a little anecdote of mine because we have our NHS teams going, make sure you protect your data and do not blah, 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 blah. And I remember once sat in my office, ping email from someone in the NHS and it was a spreadsheet of every single care home in my area with every single resident name, date of birth, contact number. And I'm suddenly going, 
Okay. Deleted it straight away. Emailed them back and said, Lord, data breach. If you've sent this out to like undisclosed recipients, you've just sent data to absolutely everybody. And they're like, oh, no, no, it's only to you. It's only to you. And that's just like a minimal sort of thing. I know we've had instances where the government have left, you know, briefcases and laptops lying around. But in the NHS, have we ever had a sort of hard data breach? Oh, my God, stop the press. We need to go and sort this out before the proverbial hits the fan. Yeah, yes, is the answer. And they're, they're, you know, they're fairly widely covered in the press. Um, you know, some people will have heard of the WannaCry, which was a cyber ransom state incident where data was exfiltrated from NHS systems at a huge scale. Um, what is done in those situations is, you know, basically the NHS forms a, you know, they've got teams and teams of people who do incident response they get together you know they kind of work really closely with the ICO because they are just as culpable in terms of the ICO they um get consultants in who do critical incident um response who will come and do like a forensic examination of what's happened they also do these huge lessons learned programs which you know they go away and they say what could we do better next time and, and hopefully you know that then informs the next round of policy which informs the next round of kind of um activities across the nhs so i would say <laughs> there's probably many incidents like adam gave because ultimately the biggest risk, risk of data is individual people and people always make mistakes and then there are the bigger kind of, um, what are they called? Rogue actors who, you know, are attacking the system to try and take data out as well, um, which can be done on a huge scale. But the toolkit looks at how you can protect your business, doesn't it, from online cyber attacks. So I think actually, if you've completed it, you lessen your chance. I mean, it's obviously always going to be that risk. And if you've got somebody that isn't tech savvy that's going on and clicking maybe a phishing scam on the bottom of an email or something, then you're never going to completely rule it out. Um, I had a question around um, the refreshing. So you obviously said that you um, refresh it annually. Is there a tracker or do people get an email to notify you that you need to refresh? Or how does that process work? So there's um, annual emails that go out in the run-up to the deadline. So the annual deadline for the ZSVT is the 30th of June. So as it's an annual year, it, it runs from you know, 1st of July to 30th of June. And in the kind of, you know, usually starting early May, end of May, mid-June, you will get reminders. If you're registered on the ZSVT, you'll get a reminder letting you know that your registration, your publication is about to expire and you need to go back in. And what are the consequences if, you don't renew. So you no longer qualify for access to any of the systems that you might be using. So NHS Mail, GP Connect, any shared access systems that you've got, you'll no longer meet the requirements to retain access to them. And just quickly, talking about GP Connect, obviously I know what that is, and I think that's a real beneficial thing for providers to have. But I feel like it's probably something that a lot of providers aren't aware of. Um, and I know we discussed it kind of briefly earlier because Adam's networking in with his doctor directly, but are you able to talk through GP Connect and kind of some of the benefits that care providers would experience from having that? Yes, yeah, sure. So um, GP Connect is a way of directly integrating your digital social care record or electronic care planning software into the GP system. So you get to see as a read-only view portions of the GP record relevant to the people you're supporting. Currently, there are three software companies who are capable of doing this. We expect it to be rolled out more. I think there's about a thousand care homes now who are accessing GP Connect. Uh, sorry to do a plug, but next month at Digital Social Care, we're doing an entire hour and a half session on talking to people using GP Connect. So do come along. Um, but generally, the sort of benefits that we see from it are is obviously having to spend ages on the phone trying to contact literally anybody at GP surgery to send over test results sort of medications updates you can see information in real time as it is in the GP record so it means you're also much more informed as well about the decisions that you're making about residents because you can see a lot more information which is relevant to providing their care so I think it's a first step 
but the early pilot's really good. Adam, did you say you've used it? Because it'd be good to hear your point of view. Sorry, uh, used. GP Connect. Yes, well, we had GP, we had in our area, you confused me, I was like, DSPT, of course, I love the DSPT. I was like, no, GP Connect. We had what was in our area is Jabber. Do you know Jabber? So we used to use Jabber quite a lot, and I'll tell you what I absolutely love, and I'm going to get her name wrong, and I'm so sorry if I do. Veronica Southern, I think it is, around um, Teleswallow, and it was all around um, speech and language therapy assessments done via um, video, which was just, uh, during the pandemic, Mwah, chef's kiss it was fantastic the ability to be able to do certain things like that and in our area as well in lancashire we were actually getting funds to upgrade our um our internet our connectivity to make sure that actually it was infallible throughout the entire buildings so there was no real excuse for us not to go i'm going to sign up for all of this because we're getting funding for it. it's free basically and we can just access all of this. So during the pandemic, when doctors wouldn't come out and nurses wouldn't come out, we were like, well, that's fine. Get on your, your iPad now. I'm going to call you and I'm going to show you. And it was great because we could go and show them things. We could talk to people directly. They could talk to the patient or, or people who were using our care. Um, so whether that is GP Connect or not, I don't know. But in our area, it was Jabba. And it gave us literally direct access to our hospitals, GPs, um, SALTs, physios, you name it. We were there. And this is the thing now as well. So if you're already using, I think it's person-centered software, Nourish or every so pass systems, then completing the DSPT to standards met, I'm not a technical person, so I'm sure they'll tell me it's more complicated from there. But from my understanding, they basically can just like talk to GP surgery and flick a switch. So it's like you already have the software, you just need to do the toolkit, and then that functionality is open and available to you. So um, I think it's worth looking into as Oh, 100%. Fully recommended. And I suppose, actually, this... Sorry, Mark. I'll let you go first. No, no. Go on. Carry on. I was going to say, this sort of brings me on to... Let's talk, you know, the standards met and everything like that. And we're talking about our own data policies, um, privacy notice on our emails, privacy notices on our website, making sure people know the data that we're holding. We do have to evidence, though, in the DSPT that we have a list of companies who also hold our data and, you know, external companies that do that work. How deep a knowledge and how deep a record do we need to keep on that to make sure that we're above board on things? So, for example, I used to have, um, we used to use an external phone system that would record people calling in and calling out. And so we made sure that we'd got a copy of their privacy notice and stuff. Do we need to have copies of them or do we just need names and links for this part? I think it's like 10.1.2 or something, isn't it? I totally just looked that up and I'm trying to sound clever. I was going to say, I think that's exactly right. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um... Yeah, so what you need to, we'd recommend you have is have a list of any company that you work with who could potentially process any personal data that's not just of residents and clients, but also of any of your staff. So if you've got an external HR company who might host any of your staff information, for example, um, you want to make sure you have a record of where you've kept your contract with that company. Um, if it's an online contract, you actually signed it, then you can just have that in a spreadsheet and link it. Um, otherwise, just make a note of where you're keeping the physical contract. You wanna make sure that the contract covers things around what happens if there is a data breach that they have to inform you, they're the data processor or the data controller. And then you wanna say when the contract ends and if there's a review date on it. So I'm not saying repeat everything is in the contract, it's basically just have a separate spreadsheet of got a contract with these people we know who they are this is when we're going to update it again brilliant thank you katie over to you mark sorry about that no no you don't have to apologize i was just going to come in when you were talking about jabber to say that kind of during the height of covid we were using wazam which is also known as kind of the blue box and actually that was really good for us being able to monitor people's stats with and without covid and actually that going directly back to the gp in real time but also to the hospital and actually to the ambulance services so when we stats were down actually we could use that data straight away on a 999 call and i don't think that would have been possible actually if we didn't have the toolkit in place i just I think this is the thing and then the thing that we talk to people all about all the time is like the opportunities it affords you and i think you know, during um the pandemic everyone got a little bit of a taste of what was available and you know for all of the awful things that the pandemic caused us one of the very few benefits that came out of it is that it just kind of forced our hands a little bit down that digital journey. 
you know, it took providers who never thought about it, you know, providers who were just still quite happy because the facts worked. And as long as the facts worked, we can do our job. Suddenly we have to find a new way of doing things. But on the other side of that, what that meant is organisations started trying things out without necessarily considering, is it safe? Do I really know where this data is going? Can I, you know, follow the train should something go wrong? And having a DSPT in place just gives you that peace of mind that you, you have got that and you know how that works. Especially as someone who's non-technical, suddenly having to have conversations around digital products or negotiate contracts, it just gives you that little bit of a framework to say, okay, well, at least now I know what I'm looking for. I know what the risk is. Excuse me, guys. No, you're okay. <laughs> please, please, please do what that guy did on the BBC where he just sort of wheels back and pushes his kid at the same time. So awesome. <laughs> uh, do you know, every week I do this show, I always have the anxiety that all three of my kids would just bombard the room, but <laughs> it's never happened. Um, I was on the... Um, was um, website and it got me kind of looking at kind of what they're doing now and just seeing what, where it is compared to kind of when I used it and it's talking a lot about kind of virtual wards and bits and pieces and a question kind of just popped into my head around is there any kind of emerging trends or technology kind of on the horizon and is the DSPT going to adapt or how is it going to adapt to that or is there any plans to adapt it? I'll take a half about the emerging tech and you can talk about the adapting DSPT for sure. Uh, yeah, so we're seeing a lot of emerging technology. You already mentioned Wazan. That's what we're seeing more and more uh, remote monitoring technologies, acoustic monitoring, radar monitoring technologies. So we can have um, either GPs or district nurses who can sort of check in on somebody remotely or in residential care, we can see it. So monitoring somebody's room for sort of noises or if they're moving around overnight which means that we don't have to be constantly waking somebody up by doing sort of like hourly checks walking into somebody's room and disturbing their sleep we can just get an alert if somebody is up and about and um, we do it that way so that's sort of one of the big emerging areas that we're seeing quite a lot of funding going into as well quite a lot of the integrated care systems have lots of money to sort of pilot this stuff so if that's of interest to you I would recommend uh, looking into that and any potential pilots. We're also seeing sort of more and more artificial intelligence being sort of embedded within software. I expect we'll see more of it in care planning, already seeing quite a lot of it around rostering as well, particularly in home care and sort of making the entire, I remember how nightmarish it can be to like write routers, <laughs> but actually trying to streamline some of that process and using the technology to help you with it. So those are sort of some of the main emerging areas that we're seeing. In terms of the DSPT kind of keeping up with that, because it's an annual um, registration, every year there's a review process that happens and it's it's starting now for this year. Um, and what will happen is the the any changes that are proposed, so it might be that, you know, a question's not fit for purpose. We do a lot of fiddling with the word and where we think, oh, people have had trouble with that. And, um, it, it really is a very collaborative process between social care and the NHS to get the social care version right. We will then work with... Um, what was the NHS digital team who own it now they're in NHS England to put together guidance, which will come out via better security, better care to make sure that people understand what the changes are or, you know, so when they go to publish for the next year, that they're, they're not suddenly posed with a question that they've never seen before, but that'll ha that happens every year. And the idea being that the DSPT remains fit for purpose as the digital kind of advances continue. I mean, I would love to, and Katie knows how um, sort of antagonistic I can be about all of this devil's advocate wise. I would love to be going to have a conversation going, it's great that the pandemic's forced us into this whole digital world, but do we think that we're rushing before we can walk? And actually, are people going to get left behind a more confused conversation for another time? Because I just think it's an interesting one to have around. There's, there's something more around um, compliance and competency that I think a discussion needs to be had on. So yes, I've completed my DSPT. No, I don't have a foggiest about what it actually means, but I know I've hit standards met. So I think there is a conversation around competency and compliance for the future, maybe. Yeah, and I think it goes beyond that as well, because it's not just what 
technology you're using as an organization, increasingly people are bringing consumer tech into your services. So I think it's increasingly important we have these conversations because what happens if someone shows up with an Alexa? Do we have a good understanding of what that means in terms of the privacy of other residents in a care home? Like you don't have any control over that. Like you know, these are the sorts of conversations we need to be thinking through. So I'm conscious of time, but yeah, I think it is an important no, conversation to be having. I think that's 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 spot on, and you know, more and more devices, more and more places are using Alexa devices, Google devices, and you only opt in as a one person. So, do you consent for us to record your sounds and your voices and all of that? You can't opt in and go. Well, actually, there's 70 people that live here, and I can't get consent from all of them, so it's probably going to be easy to say no. But it's about whether you know that on setup and understanding all of that. Let's go on to top tips because um, we've completed the DSP team. We're getting there, and there's these questions, and it's coming down to sort of protecting our data from data breaches. And uh, I love Sex and the City. I think Carrie Bradshaw is one of the worst people ever. I think her character is just awful and atrocious. But there is that famous scene where she forgets to back up her laptop and she takes in her Apple Mac and she's lost everything, the idiot. Um, and she's actually no longer got the data. You know, and there are people out there who do the same thing and aren't backing up. And there are people out there who have 1500 passwords because we have 1500 passwords and 15 capitals, two exclamation points, some special characters, an underscore. Um, and the best way they can remember them is to write them down on paper and keep them in a little folder in their office so that they've got access to them. What tips can we give people to go, actually, you need to back up. This is a great way to save your passwords. Other ways to make sure that we're doing the simplest things without having to go and spend money on protecting our data. I think if I was going to give top tips, there'd be things that you can give to your staff to help them protect things. So passwords are a brilliant one. You know, don't reuse passwords. Don't use anything that's recognisable. Try and use three non-related words. If the option's given to you on systems, use two-factor authentication. Um, ensure that if you've got a uh, bring your own device to work policy that that is adequately you know with the, there's a template one on the on the website that that is adequate for what you are actually asking staff to use it for um i think the other thing is create a culture where staff can tell you when th something's gone wrong you don't want to find out that the data went missing because so whoever found it let you know you want your staff to feel confident that they can come to you and then you can address it if you've got anything to add katie yeah, I guess on, I would just say definitely use a password manager if you're not already. I mean, just I, I use one in my personal life. It's revolutionizing. The only password I know now is the password to get into my password manager. It auto syncs across all my devices. It creates all the passwords for you. So they're all these horrendously long, like 40 character things. I don't know if you would ever remember them, but I couldn't remember them. And they're really cheap password managers. You can get ones for the business as well. So you can like, you want to be generous, you could literally sign up for one, get all your staff to have their own password manager for business things. And then that's just giving you that extra layer of protection. And I think also make sure you're not doing this on your own would be my other one. I know definitely registered managers tend to take a lot of this on themselves. And I know Michelle's already said it today, but try and share this out with your team. Talk to other people about it. If there's somebody who normally does more of the staff training side, you can lean on them to do some of that element or you focus maybe on the policy section. I think it's really important that you don't sort of feel like you just have to stare at this toolkit once a year at one in the morning on your own and like not have any help. I think they're all really great tips. And I like that three non-related word ones to make up your password. I know I'm going to go change my passwords now to three unrelated words. Governing, uh, government, honesty, competence. I think, you know, three <laughs> words will work wonderfully there. Um, no, I think they're, they're really, really good tips. And I think it's um, stuff that people can sort of absorb and, and take away and, and go and implement straight away. Mark, have you got any sort of um, experience, well, any sort of top tips that you've had from filling in the DSPT for managers um, that you, you feel like you want to share? Um. I think before I go on to any top tips, I think I'm going to get an anxiety because I'm one of those people that has the same password for everything, but it isn't anything related to me. So I think any, you'd be surprised if you guessed it, but yeah, I, I am terrible. And I remember I, it's not my pin number now, it's my bank was zero, 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 zero for years and years and years until I had to put the blinking card into the wall. It's like, I can't have that anymore. And I was, yeah. But sometimes I think some of the common passwords 
people don't really guess. I don't know if you kind of feel that, Michelle and Katie, or... It's not about people guessing them, it's about machines. The machines, yeah, I didn't think about that's, that. the, that's the thing. Before I started this job, I'll tell you, some of my passwords were my name. But now I do this job, and I also have a password manager and all of my like, computer generators. So you just for anything... Backwards. <laughs> no, don't do that. No one take any sort Brand. of advice from me around <laughs> passwords. <laughs> just for a password... Um, Generator, is there any that you can share for people listening? I'm just worried that people might go on Google and find something that's not legit and be giving away all their information. Yeah, so I'm not technically, I don't normally sort of like share or endorse them, but so the one I use is Dashlane. I find that really good. I use that for personal use. I've not tested it for business use. Uh, LastPass, I've also heard good things about. Uh, National Cyber Security Centre have sort of a recommended list as well there. They're sort of they're the main people for cybersecurity, so um, we trust anything that they put out. Um, they're all much and muchness. Also, generally speaking, for most things, you can trust the Google password manager, like the one which automatically pops up and sort of saves it in a vault. Like it's their whole business is to keep your password safe. They're pretty <laughs> much want to keep your business, so the standard ones which come in your web browser are also good to use. And I think feel like a lot of devices, so I know kind of my iPhone, my iPad, they have that built in because when I sign up for something new, it's asking me, Adam, I know you're an Android user. Do you have that on Android as well? Yeah, so on Android, you've got like, well, I use Samsung. So you have like Samsung Password Manager or Knox or something like that. I tend to use Google for my own personal stuff. Um, and I also tend to rely on, you know, like when you have to update your password, Google now actually says, recommend a strong password and they usually give you something that's like 16 characters long and i just think oh heck you know it's heck with it i'll go with that they'll remember it it's absolutely fine if not i'll just do a password reset my problem is is it takes so long to get into things sometimes now you know and it's like i know it's there for safety but i go and buy something on the internet it's like you know what's your name what's your email address you know what's your star sign and your eye color in oh i'm gonna have to send you a text now before you can buy something and i get it it's just it does take a long time nowadays to get things done. But if it's taken you that long, it's taking criminals even longer. That's true. That's true. The one time saver we can give you back as well is it's no longer recommended that you force staff to change their passwords like every three, four, five months or whatever. So because it encourages people to just use the same password and add the next number on it. Like we've all done it, haven't we? Like had like favourite football team one, favourite football team two. Uh, yeah, they don't recommend uh, doing that anymore. So does NHS Mail not force you to change your password anymore then? It's once a year now, and it has right. to be, I think, a completely different password. But yeah, National Cyber Security Centre say that forcing your staff to change passwords too frequently makes them do worse passwords. Sorry, just one last thing on the NHS Mail before I forget, because I totally did not log into my the other day, is when um, you used to be, if you were inactive for like 180 days, it would sort of like deactivate your account once it. That's changed now to something like 30 days or 60 days or something like that. So it's about just making sure that you're constantly going and you're logging in and using it. Um, if you have got your NHS Mail, don't sit here and go, oh, I did it two years ago and I've got one, because mm, if you've not been in, you don't have one now. Brilliant. I lost my NHS mail because I didn't log in. <laughs> if, if you have Outlook on like a computer in your office, just have NHS mail also on your Outlook. You can have all in one mailbox, and then that will count as you keeping to logging in, so it will keep it. Uh, but yeah, 30 days otherwise. 30 days, brilliant. Well, I have absolutely loved tonight because I love the DSPT. I think it's been a great conversation. I think it's turned something that is no offence, really not sexy, into something fun and understandable. I think, you know, we've all understood a little bit more about it. I'm hoping for people feel a little bit more brave going into it. Um, if anything, I hope what people take away from this is the importance of doing it. You know, you may not be able to watch this one hour's worth of care and view and go, I can complete this from start to finish now. Maybe there's a podcast in there somewhere. We never know. Maybe we should do one. We did it for the PIR. Um, but 
maybe you are going away going, actually, maybe I should go and do this now. I've just signed up to the ICO because I didn't know I had to do that. I'll not give the chickens the shredded paper or save it up for bonfire night and, and do that. Um, so, yeah, hopefully people do feel a little bit more um, encouraged about this. And Katie, Michelle, thank you so much for giving up this this hour of your evening. And we've had a strong viewership throughout tonight, which I'm always shocked with on a, on a Tuesday I always say when Bake Off's on, we do struggle slightly. There is a bit of competition for us when Bake Off's on. Um, but, you know, it's it's evident that people in social care need the support. So thank you both so much um, for joining us this evening. Mark, 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 what did I say we were discussing next week? We are discussing nursing in social care next week. So I'm actually really looking forward to it because it's not a topic that's quite often, dis I think it is on kind of Twitter and social media, but kind of in the wider context of social care, it's not something that's really discussed as kind of much, but... No, and it's not, and you know, especially in my area, there are so the homes that are deregistering in our area from the Care Quality Commission tend to be nursing homes not residential homes because they're just not finding the nurses to staff them um so i mean i'm you know i'm looking forward to it. we've got some good guests i think next week have we we have we are joined by put me on the spot um deborah sturdy is one of them i don't have my spreadsheet open and I'm, i should have had it open because you do this every week <laughs> to me where you're like why is i just remembered the topic for next week but yeah we've got deborah sturdy joining us jonathan bb um somebody who's head of nursing for the icb um so i think it's going to be a really good show and i think it'll be really informative i just want Brilliant. to say thank you michelle and katie for joining i popped it in the chat but do make sure you go and check out digital social care website because there are loads of tools the events and i know that either michelle or katie you touched on it about the training and different bits and pieces that you've got going on so definitely go and check that out wonderful are you going to the trade shows next week are you going to be at uk care week Fabulous. Another reason to go to UK Care next week, next week. Go and see Katie. Go and see the digital social care team. Michelle, are you going to be there? Oh, I'm going to come and see you as well. I'm going to come and say hi. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, this is The Caring View uh, podcast, chat show, free resources. Go to www.thecaringview.co.uk um, and you can access everything from there. Become one of our 1.5 thousand YouTube subscribers and hit that subscribe button now. Tap that bell. You'll never miss out. Um, on anything we absolutely do and obviously go and subscribe to our spotify until then we will see you twice next week once online talking around uh, digital uh, digital social care talking around uh, nursing in social care and then once in person at uk care week and don't forget to get your audition tapes in for care sectors got talent good night god bless and have a good evening good night everyone <laughs>